Okay, well, good morning, everyone. <coughs> I'm going to talk uh, once again uh, about the future of UK financial reporting um, requirements. Those of you who have been to these sessions um, in the past will know this is something which has come up over the last few years. It's been a very, very um, long-standing project uh, for the Financial Reporting Council. We are into the end game uh, now. It's almost sort of there. It's almost um, all about to come into effect. The standard set of the Financial Reporting Council has finished its work. We have finalised standards uh, now, uh, which we didn't have last year, although we knew pretty much what they were going to look like. Um, and so the challenge now is obviously for those who produce accounts and audit them and so on to get to grips with the changes which are going to take place, look at the practical effects um, of new standards um, and figure out how, uh, how those are actually going to take effect. Um, as a firm, having got the finalised version of the standards, we're now getting to grips with those and um, what effect they'll have. Um, as this year wears on, um, we will start to talk to our clients and look specifically what impact the changes um, will have on you, if any. Uh, maybe significant in some cases, and maybe virtually no effect at all um, in others. It's something we need to be aware of. Um, if any of you have queries on any of this uh, at any point, I would urge you just to talk to your relationship <coughs> partner or talk to me, um, and uh, we can look at, uh, at uh, solving those queries. But as I say, finally, after many, many years, um, we are in a sort of a, a definitive position as to what's going to happen. Um, what it also means is that I'm going to need to think of something else to talk about uh, next year now, which I, I ought to start work on very soon. Okay, so what are the sort of key messages of this uh, coming out of this process? Well, the first one is that, um, let me just put one of those up. Um, nobody who doesn't currently have to, reply, uh, to have to apply full international standards is going to have to as a result of these changes. So there's no extension, as we once thought there might be, um, of the full international standard population, which is good news. If you are a small entity, applying financial reporting standard for small entities, there will also be no change for you, okay? for the time being at least. I'll qualify that slightly by saying there will be some conforming changes uh, to the frizzy, um, just to bring it in line with the other new standards which are being brought out. There will be one point of substance which I spotted, which I'll talk about uh, further on. But essentially, uh, no change for small entities, which is also good news. Everybody else, so everybody who doesn't have to apply full international standards but doesn't qualify small, <coughs> will have to apply FRS 102. Um, for accounting periods commencing on after the 1st of January 2015. 2015 is the definitive date. Again, we thought that was going to be the case last year, but that is finally confirmed. What that means is if you do have to move on to FRS 102, um, you have to start thinking about this in terms of the first comparative year, um, sorry, the comparative year that is in the first set of accounts which you will prepare um, following FRS 102. So straightforward example, if you have a calendar year and if you have a December year and 31st December year end, um, the first set of accounts you'll have to do under FRS 102 will be for the year and 31st December 2015, but you will have to restate your comparative figures in those accounts, so the 2014 figures will have to be redone in line with FRS 102. So the conversion date, what the standard refers to as the date of transition, is actually the 1st of January 2014 in that case. Okay, so less than eight months away, and you know, we have to sort of start really um, beginning to apply this stuff. <clears throat> so those are the sort of basic key messages. Just a reminder, really, of what the new standards are. Well, three new standards. Um, FRS 100 um, is the one which says this is what everybody has to do. So what I've just described um, before, if you already have to apply full international standards, you carry on doing so. Um, and who applies uh, FRS 102 and who applies the FRISI. Okay. <clears throat> what FRS 100 also does is withdraw all of the existing um, UK accounting standards. So all of the old SAPs, FRSs, UITF, abstracts um, will all be withdrawn. 
Okay, apart from FRS 27, which applies to if you write life assurance contracts. I can't imagine there's anyone in the room who does that. Um, FRS 27 lives on for a while and will ultimately be replaced by FRS 103, but none of that is out. Um, as I say, I suspect it's not uh, desperately relevant. Um, so FRS 100 says what everybody has to do. FRS 101 deals with the individual accounts of companies following full international standards. What it does is just exclude a few disclosures in those accounts. I'll look very, very briefly at that one a bit further on. <coughs> FRS 102, as I say, this is the sort of the big one which will apply to anybody who doesn't qualify a small financial reporting standard applicable in the UK and Republic of Ireland. So everything existing goes and it's replaced effectively for practical purposes with this single standard which covers everything. <coughs> as I've said, as a firm, we're assessing the practical um, impact of these and we'll be talking to you later in the year more about um, specific effects. You can download the new standards from the FRCs, from the Financial Reporting Council's website, um, or just uh, get in touch. If you want to start reading the standards, looking at what's in there, just let me know and I can email them um, to you. So as we said, FS100, who does what? Well, that's basically what I've said here, uh, already said. So apply full international standards if you already have to. Otherwise, you apply FRS 102 unless you're entitled to apply the FRISM. Um, there's an option to sort of trade up, so if you qualify as small and could apply the FRISM if you wanted, you could nevertheless decide to apply FRS 102. That might, for example, apply to small subsidiaries of, of groups that, are, that are overall aren't small and have to apply FRS 102, so the requirements throughout the group are the same. Similarly, you can trade up from either of those to apply for IFRS. So again, if you're a member, uh, a subsidiary of a group that's preparing accounts um, under full IFRS could itself apply for IFRS. Okay. So trading, obviously no trading down though. If you fit, to, if you fall into one of these higher levels, then you can't say, I'm going to do any less than I, than I have to. Early application, what does FRS 100 say about early application? Well, if you fall into the FRS 102 category, um, you can apply it early. Okay, so it can be applied in respect of accounting periods ending on or after 31st December 2012. So effectively, as of now, um, it can be brought in if you were mind to um, doing that. Quick look at FRS 101. As I said, this applies if you're applying full international standards um, in your individual accounts. And what it basically says, it cuts out a load of the disclosures in individual accounts of group members um, if that information is given in the overall group account. So the same disclosure means time and time again. Um, and it's the usual kind of stuff. So a group member, um, if for example a consolidated cash flow statement is published, the individual group members don't have to give them in their own accounts. And the same for all the other bits and pieces that are listed. And, um, I'll skip on from that because again, as I said, I suspect there's no uh, or very little application of that um, in the room. So, on to FRS 102, the Financial Reporting Standard for the United Kingdom and Republic of Ireland. Um, this is based um, on an international standard uh, called the International Financial Reporting Standard for Small and Medium <coughs> Sized Entities, which itself is a boiled down version of full international standards. So what's happened, the international standard set has boiled down its own standards, and then the Financial Reporting Council in the UK has said, well, let's take this boiled down version and then adapt it, uh, simplify it in certain areas, actually, um, to make it um, applicable um, in the UK. <coughs> and what it is, it's basically a comprehensive um, accounting handbook within one document it covers all aspects of um, producing a set of company accounts or for any other entity that's needing, needing to apply these standards. It's split into 35 sections, each section covers a different aspect of the accounts preparation process and consists of about 350 pages. A okay? hundred or so of those pages are all the sort of preamble about all the head scratching that went on in, in devising the standard and, and considering what uh, goes in there. 
So there's really about 250 pages of stuff which says how to uh, produce a set of accounts. Okay? At the moment, if you're following full UK standards, there are about 2,500 pages um, of requirements. If we had to go on to full international standards, there would be 3,500 pages um, of such requirements. So this is really boiling it down, really simplifying it. Um, it's very accessibly written, I so say engagingly written, but it's accessibly written. It's not the sort of usual wording of accounting standards that we're, we're, we're used to. Um, it's quite easy going um, in that sense. I would guess <coughs> that you can read it in the course of about a day just to see what's uh, there. Obviously, you need, need to deal more thinking as to what the actual practical effects are. But in the course of a day, were you to want to, um, you will be able to read all of the UK um, accounting requirements which are going to be in place from, from 2015. It's not being said specifically, but it's expected that the Financial Reporting Council will update this about every three years or so. The reason we think that is because the International Standard Setter has said that it will update the IFRS for SMEs every three years or so. Okay? So by and large, we should know when future changes are likely to come in. It's not going to be the case that they'll suddenly say, well, we'll change our minds about this, and that will come in from next month or next year. We expect that it will be every three years that's when the thing will be updated. Okay? So what's happening for the vast majority there for the companies in the UK, we're not moving on to full international accounting principles, but we're moving towards them, to something that is very closely based um, on international standards. Okay. <clears throat> what will accounts look like um, under FRS 102? So what's the basic structure of accounts going to look like well, not a huge amount of difference to what we're used to at the moment. Um, FRS 102 refers back to the Companies Act uh, regulations um, uh, for the format and content of accounts. Um, it does include these sort of international uh, standards based um, terms such as stated, statement of financial position. Um, but it then says, well, if you want to call the balance sheet, balance sheet, you can. Okay? It talks about presenting a single statement of comprehensive income, which includes everything, all your realised and unrealised profits and so on. Or it says, well, if you fancy having something called a profit and loss account, and then a, a statement of other comprehensive income, which is things like certain revaluations and other unrealised items, um, then you can. So that kind of fits with the current structure of profit and loss account and statement of uh, total recognised uh, gains and losses. Um, one sort of minor, relatively minor sort of change is that the statement of changes in equity, the movement in shareholders' funds, as we call it at the moment, which currently appears in a note to the account, has to be given the prominence of a primary statement. So it sits directly behind the uh, profit and loss account and balance sheet. Okay? But fundamentally, not much is going to change um, in terms of the format of the account. The statements as to what we've complied with and so on will clearly change, but again, that's that's largely disclosure. <clears throat> in terms of more substantive changes, well, what actually will go on? Well, a lot of what is in there is in line with existing UK practices, not least because over the last few years, UK standards or were for a period of time moving into line with international standards um, anyway. <clears throat> so a lot of what changes uh, will not be too dramatic. Um, however, some areas will differ significantly, which I'll talk to a little bit further, uh, further on. And really, it's the nature of your company and what's going on in there, what kind of assets and liabilities you've got, what kind of activities you carry out, um, that will determine the sort of magnitude and change um, that will affect you as a result of the introduction of the new standard. Um, some of the more major uh, changes, then, the big one, really, uh, which everybody is sort of saying, this is where we're going to have to do some serious thinking about things, is in relation to financial instruments. Um, for the first time, really, in the United Kingdom um, accounting requirements, we have uh, comprehensive guidance in the new standard on how to treat financial instruments. At the moment, there's some very basic stuff in the Companies Act that says, well, things like trade letters and creditors, current assets and liabilities and so on, 
treat it low of, uh, of uh, cost and net realizable value. Um, but that's all that's really said. The standards are silent on this kind of thing. What FRS 102 does is say, well, looking at all financial instruments, which includes very straightforward stuff like our bank accounts, straightforward loans, trade debtors, trade creditors, and so on, it divides everything up into two classifications. So basic ones, as I say, are the sort of easy stuff, the cash trade debtors, um, straightforward loans where you have a single variable rate of interest, for example, and it's just basic straightforward accounting, exactly as we do um, at the moment. Anything which doesn't drop into this basic uh, category um, is termed an other uh, financial instrument, um, and it includes all the sort of more complex, more spicy sort of things. So things such as interest rate swaps, forward contracts, options, futures contracts, um, investments in convertible debt, uh, all of those kinds of things. And the basic rule in the standard is that those types of financial instruments, anything which doesn't fit the basic definition, um, is valued at fair value. What that means is you attach a fair value to the uh, particular item, that is included in the balance sheet, and the change in that fair value from year to year goes through the profit and loss account. Okay? At the moment, for complex, for what amounts to sort of complex or other financial instruments in this terminology, um, we will just or should just disclose the fair value um, at the year end in each year's set of accounts. But this actually incorporates those values um, into the accounts themselves. And so the movements go through um, the profit and loss account. That may well increase profit and loss account volatility. One of the things which the standard um, says is well, it's recognised that, that usually um, complex financial instruments are put in place to manage risk. You, you normally have a sort of derivative, some kind of um, forward contract or option or whatever to manage some um, exposure in another um, asset or liability in the balance sheet. Okay, hopefully the two will sort of balance each other out. Um, and subject to a series of fairly detailed rules, this must be the most sort of complex area of the standard itself, um, it's possible to adopt hedge accounting in those situations. So you can set off, if you're involved or if you're um, putting um, financial instruments in, in place in order to manage the risk that you're exposed to in other assets and liabilities, you can effectively, very broad terms, set off the movements um, in those values from year to year, which sort of does away then with, uh, with the volatility which might otherwise um, result. So comprehensive guidance, then, as I say, that seems to be, I suspect that's going to be sort of the real sort of biggest thing which we have to get to grips with. <coughs> um, if you have a defined benefit pension scheme, uh, the recognition of um, the uh, figures relating to that scheme um, differs. There's a new component of the scheme cost, which is called net interest or income um, cost. Uh, the key point there is that the amounts go through the profit and loss account, whereas at the moment on the defined benefit pension scheme, the expected return on investments goes to the profit and loss account, which generally serves to increase the profit. Um, the amount going through the profit and loss account um, in future will just be the actual interest income received in the period, which is generally, if not always, going to be a much lower figure. So that could have a downward um, impact on profits. Everything else still makes its way through what will be termed state of comprehensive income. So you end up in the same balance sheet position, but reported profit uh, may differ as a result. Investment properties. Um, what seems like a fairly sort of innocuous change in terminology there, investment properties in future will be valued at fair value rather than open market value which is what SAT-19 uh, currently requires. In the majority of cases, fair value is probably going to equate to market value, so no change there, although in specialist property investment com companies, that may lead to a change. Okay? The key point is that any revaluations, movements in the value from year to year, will go through the profit and loss account, okay? rather than through the state of total recognised gains and losses, as at present. So once again, you know, it could be um, increasing or decreasing the profit, obviously. Um, certainly increasing volatility um, from year to year, or potential volatility. Um, 
the point to be careful, of course, is the distributable reserves, because we could end up with um, unrealized profits um, in our retained profit figure. We think that it would still be acceptable to hold the uh, differences on the valuation of investment properties in a separate reserve to make that clear. Um, but that's not, we're not totally certain of that. It's one of the things that we're, we're looking into. Um, but that is a, a, a significant change in the treat if you have um, investment properties. Similarly, SAP 19 at the moment scopes out from the investment property definition any properties which are rented to fellow group members. Okay, and that scoping out doesn't happen in FRS 102. So if you're a member of a group with properties which you're investing, uh, which you're sorry, renting to other group members, um, you will have been able up to now just to value those properties at cost or, or you know, periodic revaluation or, or whatever. Um, this is saying that you have to treat those um, as investment properties in exactly the same way as you would with any other property that's rented outside the group. <coughs> Business combinations. Um, at present, of course, FRS 6 um, allows, if certain conditions are met, allows um, business combinations to be accounted for as mergers, okay, rather than acquisitions. So merger accounting, no, requisite, uh, no recognition of goodwill, and so on. That will be seriously restricted when FRS 102 comes in, because what it says is that it's only in a group reconstruction situation, group restructuring, um, that merger accounting will be allowed. Okay, so any situation where something is coming into the group from outside, outside is going to have to be accounted for um, as an acquisition. <clears throat> Moving more in line with international standards, um, there will be a requirement to recognise more in the way of intangible assets on an acquisition. At the moment, um, in very broad terms, look at what we've paid, look at what we've got, and we pick out very little in the way of intangibles before sort of saying, well, the balance of what we paid is goodwill. Okay. FRS 1 and 2 says, well, no, there's more in the way of intangibles which you will have to recognise, attach a value to, which may increase, obviously, sort of inconvenience and, and costs, potentially of own valuations, um, before saying, well, what's left is our goodwill figure. The kind of things that we're talking about there are things such as brands, copyrights, licenses, and so on, which wouldn't normally be recognised um, in an acquisition at the moment. Will those different assets have different amortisation periods associated? Yep, they could well do. Yep. A point just to be careful of here is that um, FRS 102 brings in this concept of a default useful economic life for. Um, goodwill and other intangibles. So if you can't reach a reliable estimate of the useful economic life of goodwill, for example, FS102 will say, well, that value is, uh, sorry, that life is, uh, is five years. Okay? There's a potential sting in the tail here, I think, because I suspect there's been some misunderstanding of the existing standard, FRS10, which says, um, if you treat the useful life as being more than 20 years, you have to have annual impairment reviews, impairment reviews each year. It's possible that that has been sort of treated as a default useful economic life for goodwill. Okay? So, in effect, somebody may have said, well, we'll call it 20 years, we'll write up over 20 years, and that will be okay, without actually having any sort of detailed consideration of what the actual useful economic life might be. Now, when FRS 102 um, comes into force, um, clearly, say you've got a 20-year uh, useful economic life for, for, for goodwill, say you've written off 10 years uh, worth of that, um, but you haven't got any sort of um, um, definitive, uh, um, can't the word, uh, definitive justification for a useful economic life, this study will come in and say, well, how long has the goodwill been in place? Well, 10 years at the moment. What's your justification for that? Uh, how have you estimated that? Well, if there's nothing in place to say this is what justifies the 20-year life, this will say, well, that should have been written off over five years. Okay? So that will mean that it should have been written off significantly before 
the new standard started being applied. So that would be a prior year adjustment. We'd say, well, what we thought we had there for another 10 years was actually gone five years ago under the new rules. Okay? So what I would say there is if you have any concerns over goodwill and intangible asset lives, start considering those now and start thinking about justifying why you're following the amortisation policy that you're following. Okay? Um, negative goodwill, if that arises, if we actually end up getting more than we paid for, um, at the moment that's generally released over a period of years, commensurate with the depreciation of the assets that it relates to, um, uh, it, usually that will now be released to the profit and loss accounts under um, FRS 1 and 2. <coughs> Just um, a final point on acquisitions. There's a transitional, some transitional relief in FRS 1 and 2 which says um, any acquisition which took place um, before the date of transition, so to take the December year as an example again, you'll have to apply FRS 102 for the first time in, uh, for the year of December 2015. Um, the standard says any acquisition which took place before the 1st of January 2014, the transition date, the first day of the comparative period, <coughs> those accounts um, can just be left undisturbed in your FRS 102 accounts. If it's taken place after the 1st of January 2014, then it has to be revisited under FRS 102 rules. If you've accounted it for, for it as a merger, for example, you would probably have to re-account for it as an acquisition. Um, if you've uh, not picked out some sort of certain intangibles that the standard would re require you to do, you'll have to recompute your goodwill and so on. So on that December year an example, you get away with it if the acquisition takes away place before 1st of Jan 2014. If it's later than that, then you will have to re-account for it. So that could be quite a major operation. Deferred tax. Um, the basic um, approach will continue to apply. So this timing difference approach, looking at um, time in on which um, Tax allowance was received compared to the date at which they're, they're recognised in, in the accounts. We compute the time differences, calculate deferred tax based on those. The big difference is that this applies to many, many more things potentially, and principally um, revaluations. <coughs> so again, for example, if you have investment property or indeed any other assets that you've revalued, you will have to provide for deferred tax um, on those revaluations, even though you're not in a process of selling the assets. The FRS 19 at the moment says, well, you only account for something on a, on a revaluation if you're committed to selling the assets at that price. This says, any revaluation, you work out deferred tax on it. Okay? And you won't be allowed if you're in the habit of discounting your deferred tax. I mean, it doesn't ever come across anybody who is, but that isn't going to be allowed um, anymore. Um, Slightly curious one, holiday pay um, accruals. You may or may not uh, provide for these um, at the moment. Nothing in the existing uh, standards actually refers to these specifically. FRS 102 has a whole section on short-term employee benefits. And within that, it talks about accumulating compensated absences, which is basically saying holiday pay, if you like, if the employees have accru um, accrued uh, time that they can take off and they'll still be paid for, and the standard says you have to recognise the value of that um, at the balance sheet date. So if you haven't done that before, that is something that is now sort of specifically required by the standard. Obviously materiality um, applies, so if you don't know at the moment that any holiday pay provision would be immaterial, and you're probably going to have to do a bit of work on working that out just to demonstrate that you didn't actually need to in the first place. Okay. And the final point is, and these are the, I'd say the major sorts of changes which we see at the moment, um, prior period adjustments, PYAs, prior year adjustments. Um, we're moving, uh, the standard moves on again onto the international principle which says um, if you complete the accounts for one year, um, and then subsequently find that there was a material error in those accounts, in your next year's accounts, you will have to restate the comparative figures in respect of correcting that material error. Okay? So any material item, 
hope we don't produce a cat for material errors in. Um, but um, <coughs> if we did, if something quantifies that something is material, then it would have to be adjusted as a prior adjustment, rather than just being corrected through the current year's figures. What's the difference to current treatment? Well, currently, um, prior year figures would only be restated for a fundamental error, which is far um, in excess of something that is just material. Fundamental is basically saying, well, the accounts as a whole are just meaningless or, or overall don't give a true and fair view. Material is, is, is it material to the particular area of the accounts that affects or, or whatever? It's a whole lot less um, figure. So prior period adjustments may become more common, although, as I say, hopefully, in general, um, accounts don't get issued with material errors in them anyway. Okay, so those are the sort of main changes which we perceive um, at the moment. <coughs> Again, similarly to FRS 101 for full international uh, standards <coughs> and accounts, FRS 102 includes some group disclosure exemptions. It's basically saying if you're a member of a group that has group accounts published under FRS 102 in your individual accounts, you don't have to produce a cash flow statement, you need to have a key management compensation or share based payments or financial instrument disclosures. So pretty sort of similar to now, FRS 1 that says that if you include your consolidated accounts, you don't have to produce your own cash flow statement, for example. So some fairly sensible um, disclosure exemptions there. If anybody is subject to sort statements of recommended practice, looking down the list, I don't think I spotted immediately on today, but these are the sort of the, the charities sort, one applying to LLPs, pension schemes, and so on. And what they are basically a recommended practice saying, well, this is how we apply um, basic accounting requirements in relation to particular types of, um, of entity. They call themselves recommended practice. Some of them have legal effect. The charity sort, for example, um, is mentioned in the Charities Act, and charities have to follow it as a result of that. Most of these are in the process of being writ uh, rewritten. Sorry. Um, if anybody applies the oil and gas sort, that will remain unchanged. And again, if you apply the sort on banking segments or um, uh, leasing, which is in terms of lessors rather than lessees, um, those will be um, withdrawn. All the others are being rewritten. Um, how does that impact on early adoption for anybody who has to follow a sort? Well, the FRC have said you can early adopt, but you just have to adapt what's in the current sort to make it work in line with FRS 102. Okay. Which probably suggests that any sorts that are being rewritten aren't going to change um, that much. That's the basics of FRS 102. And as I say, over the next few months, you'll be hearing more from us about how it will specifically um, impact um, on you.